a couple of cars right here. <laughs> We're stuck and I uh, got a baby here. Uh. You and a baby and what? The winds are too strong? Yes. Ma'am, you need to open your window. The pressure is not so it's going to blow out the window. Oh, God. you got to calm down, okay? Huh? Don't worry, you're going to be okay. Yeah? Then you have to wait it out. You have to wait it out because there's nothing we can do right now, okay? Okay. You're just too strong. Typhoon Paxana upgraded to a super typhoon slammed into the islands of Guam and Rota. Residents are saying that the damage may be the worst ever. There is really few other places on Earth as isolated as the Pacific Islands, especially in times of catastrophic weather crisis. In the past year, they've had an earthquake, they've had two typhoons. They have been through tremendous hard times. We had a, a super typhoon with winds hundreds of miles an hour, widespread uh, destruction. The power's out, the water's out, the port caught on fire, the airport's closed. It's like a, a worst case scenario. People realize that the people that are serving them, the firemen, the policemen, everybody that's helping out in the disaster assistance has been affected at least in some way or hurt in some way. While it was the, uh, the policemen out there trying to make sure that things were safe for people to, to pass to the firefighter that was trying to help pull people's you know, belongings out while you know, you know, risking themselves during high winds or maybe reporters out trying to tell a story. We were victims too, but I think that our sense of um, the duty to our jobs, um, we wanted to make sure that those were uh, taken care of first because a lot of people depend on us. Everybody that we encountered was a victim. They had lost their homes. Many of the hotel workers had lost everything they owned, and they still came to work. And they came to work for one reason, and that was to make sure that we had what we needed to do our jobs. We've been working like 16-hour days, uh, seven days a week. A lot of those guys don't even, didn't even go home to take care of their house yet. We have to take into account that first responders can and will be victims in a disaster of any sort, whether it be man-made or, or natural. And that's going to require us to provide a more flexible response. Port fire is something that nobody could have counted on. During the storm, there was an explosion at the island's only fuel farm. The heat was, was so intense. You could feel it a block away. That became our first official post typhoon crisis, something that we hadn't faced before and something that we hadn't expected and something that we didn't know exactly how to deal with. If somebody had designed this for an exercise, we would have said, no, no, that's ridiculous, that's way too hard. Well, that didn't just create a fire or a hazard there. It impacted the entire unleaded gasoline supply, not only for Guam, but the entire Western Pacific. So it literally brought all wheeled transportation to its knees. We really found out just how reliant we as an island community can be on fuel. It even impacted getting all the folks in the federal family to work every day. Finding that the government was able to respond to that crisis and was able to even organize an island transportation system, I thought was nothing short of amazing. People started to think, well, I'm going to need to feed my family. Is there any electricity anywhere? No. Are we going to have any electricity uh, for any time? No. We don't have water service. How long is it going to take for that to be restored? Who's here on island? Does anybody know about our situation? Here, we were in a very extended, very critical response phase for three to five weeks. If only one jurisdiction, one state, one territory is hit, it's pretty easy. But what gets really complicated is where you have you know, two, three, four jurisdictions hit. We need to figure out in what order we need to bring things, and then we need to figure out where that should go. So we just have to think about multi-jurisdictional operations. There's the time difference, there's the sheer logistics of trying to get something across 6,000 miles of water. The first three weeks we thought nothing but bring water, bring generators, you know, emergency power restoration, critical infrastructure restoration, health and welfare of the victims, health and welfare of the federal family. We have to work with them to figure out what it is exactly they're asking for and then interpret that into something that we can provide. You can't decide in the morning that you're going to put resources or people on the ground someplace ahead of a hurricane and have them there that night. You have to think 36 hours, 72 hours ahead and take deliberate actions. If they have a requirement for medical teams, they have to let us know that that is more important than tents because we have to figure out and phase in what types of assistance are going to be on that first plane. 
The Guam Memorial Hospital is uh, not the only hospital of last resort, it is the hospital of only resort. I've seen a lot of medical facilities in disaster areas, but uh, this was absolutely the worst. We evacuated the uh, expectant mothers, we evacuated the uh, pediatrics ward, because the wall there actually was uh, about to fall down. There was virtually no lighting. They were performing minor surgery with flashlight. The emergency room was lost. That required us to bring in supplementary medical support. The Air Force brought in its uh, EMEDS unit and uh, we brought in uh, two disaster medical assistance teams which are part of the National Disaster Medical System. They asked for a mobile hospital and that was to kind of decompress the need for emergency room visits at Guam Memorial Hospital. The challenges that we faced were pretty significant. A lot of them were interrelated. They had no power and that impacted the ability of not only the residents here but businesses to get back online and the local government. Therefore, a big priority was emergency power restoration. You know, large generators, 200, 300, 400, 500 kV generators, 750 kV generators, the size of semis. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers does that for us, and they do a number of things for us. Uh, they do the debris removal mission, they do the emergency power mission, they do the water and ice mission. Oh, the, the generators went to the state, to the uh, government of Guam. We put them at uh, the 911 center, the repeater sites. We also had them staged at the, uh, the Guam Memorial Hospital. And then from there we went to uh, all the various sewer pumps and water treatment plants. Pre-staging assets in the Pacific is key because that will buy you the time to get your logistical string in order on the mainland in order to keep that pipeline full of commodities. If you don't think ahead, if you don't have that pipeline, a good planning in place, then the pipe is going to run dry. As soon as the, uh, the state came up with their numbers as far as what they needed out there in the different villages from the mayors, we went ahead and responded to them with the cots, the blankets, the food, the MREs, and then the tents. That's what our job is, is to supplement state and local assistance, whether it's Homeland Security, whether it's EPA, whether it's Department of Transportation, whether it's DOD, our job is to supplement the local governments here. Ladies and gentlemen, for your information, the pipe supplies are in. I think in times of crisis, information is key. Knowing what's available and what's not available is equally important. You know, it's really tough. If you've got a community that's just gone through something as devastating as that storm, I think all they want is people to be upfront. This isn't a stupid community. They know what questions aren't being answered, you know, and they know what questions aren't being asked. We were able to put out common messages to let people know where we were at each and every day in all phases of the disaster, so they knew exactly what was going on. I think that the single biggest lesson that we took home with us is the need for coordination. That coordination is critical in order to provide timely assistance. Really, emergency managers need to consider the cumulative effect of multiple events on a community, not only on the infrastructure, but also on the psyche of the people, and how do we help them. I think there is a lot of value to be learned, too, about the staging of the personnel that we bring in to a disaster area, particularly in the Western Pacific, but it also has application, I think, to a major disaster, a catastrophic disaster in a major metropolitan area. People on the ground are the ones that need to make the decisions about what types of assistance, what types of goods need to be sent out. It's a pull, not push system. And that's the only way it will work out here. Don't go to your counterpart in the government and say, well, give me your list, give me your list. You know what? They don't have the list right there. It probably washed out to sea. We are the experts. We need to anticipate what we think they're going to need and start planning on that basis so that when they dig out of the rubble, when they push the water out of their house, when they start asking for those things, that we're already working on those and we're helping them do their jobs.